We are few, but we are mighty this morning, are we not? Yes, so here's the deal. Sing, sing loud through that mask, and then also when Casey says something funny, like, it, you got to really go for it, because he can't, you know, he's got he's to feel you. We need some amens. We need all of that this morning, so bring the energy. Right? Yes, thank you. Let's go. Um, okay, just a couple of real quick announcements. First of all, uh, next week we are back to normal, so we'll have our Saturday night service at 7 p.m., and that's the one that we will record and then we'll have our 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. So if you're watching online and you're used to that sort of rhythm and routine of watching church on Sunday morning, we're sorry that this week you're watching it at some other point. Uh, but next week we will be back to normal. It would be available late, late Saturday night or early Sunday morning, and you can watch it at any point after you wake up. So... Um, also, I want to say uh, for live church next week... Uh, it is possible to sign up. It should be possible to sign up right now. And the way that you would do that is you would go to brookviewchurch.com. And I think we have, do we have, we do, a slide. So just go to brookviewchurch.com and you can sign up. Uh, and that is not a rude thing to be doing. Right now, what would you guys normally be doing during announcements? You'd be filling out communication cards. Absolutely. Or and, and while you're listening also. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but you'd be filling out communication cards. So Right now, we're, we're touchless. The way that you fill out your communication card is how? Online. online. So you go to brookviewchurch.com and you fill out your online communication card, which means you can be doing that right now or at any point this morning. Um, let's see. One more announcement is your online communication card. I already covered that. So if you've got anything, here's what I would want to say. This is a really, really tough season for many people. And then for many people, like financially and, and otherwise, we're, we're doing okay. Um, and so there's two things that you can do on your communication card that I want to highlight. One is if you say, hey, I just want to be available to help any sort of needs that come along in this season in our church along the way, um, you can mark that on your communication card. We will put you in a database of people that have said, I'm interested in helping. But the second thing is that some of you are in a spot where you are struggling. Uh, there's been job loss or there's been something going on and you are in need in some way, how would you let us know that? You would let us know that through your communication card. Let us know that you are in need and then we can connect you with resources or people that are wanting to help. And so um, please, please, please do that and please feel free to do that and utilize that. Um, that's all the announcements that I have. You guys, it's so good to see live faces. You guys are safe and sane. I'm assuming yesterday was good. Yesterday was good? Okay, good. Well, let me pray. Um, Casey's going to make his way up, but let me pray, and um, I'm excited. Case, I'm excited. I love this passage, so I'm super excited. God, I just thank you for our ability to be able to be here. I thank you for the health of those that are here, and, um, and I just pray that you would, that you would bless this time. Um, we need to hear from you. Um, whether we whether we come in really feeling that or not, we do need to hear from you. And this morning, God, I pray that you would you'd open our hearts, you'd open our minds, and you would enable us to hear from you whatever it is you have to say to each of us personally. And God, would you give us the courage um, to respond to whatever that is? God, I pray that you would speak powerfully through Casey. I pray that you would anoint him with your spirit and that you would fill this place. And I pray that after this message, when we spend some time worshiping, um, it would be sincere, and it would be locked in on you and who you are. So would you bless this time? Pour yourself out here, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Fourth of July weekend, guys. Hope it was a good time. I was with my brother, and uh, him and his buddies spent like $2,000 on fireworks. They were the show of the neighborhood. It was a good time. Um, if you don't know, my name's Casey. Um, I'm not the main guy in this church. The handsome devil who is just up here is, um, but I get the chance to fill in for him every once in a while. Um, and I gave a message two weeks ago that was titled Mountains and Valleys, and we talked about why I think sometimes Christians find themselves frustrated. And Jason, he asked me to speak again this week, and, and I was thinking through it, and I was like, I kind of want to revisit um, at that idea. So this is like a part two to that. Um, so a quick overview for those who weren't here and a, and a quick recap for those who were. Um, we looked at a story in Luke chapter 9 where Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life 
will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So Jesus says, I want you to live your life selflessly. I want you to, not, to deny yourself, live for my mission, which is for other people. I want you to do that daily. And where the frustration happens is when we begin to orient our lives around the mission, but also try and orient around our own schedules and, and obtain possessions and status and renown, because we have kind of one foot in both worlds, the, the spiritual world, you know, the earthly world, um, and we find ourselves frustrated. Now, am I saying you can't have toys and fun and good time and just take a week for the family? No, that's not what I'm saying. This is, it's, it's more of a heart posture. It's a heart posture. It's like money. Money is not evil. It's the love of money. It's the pursuit of money um, that controls us and consumes us that's not good. You know, if you're, if you're wise with money, if you're a good steward, it can oftentimes be on mission, how you use it, how you think of it. Um, so it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's internal. It's not really external. People can't really see it. Um, people don't really know what's going on. It's internal. It's like Jason, he talked uh, a couple weeks ago about two houses, one built on the rocks, one built on the sand. And, and from a distance, you can't see the difference. You, can't, you, you, you don't know what's, what's, what's going on, but it's not until the storm comes that you can see one's built on a strong foundation and can weather the storm, and the other one doesn't. It's, it can't last. So last time, we talked about why you might be frustrated, and this morning, I want to talk about why you might be tired or weary or, or worn out. Um, and, and guys, get this. So Jason, he, he started a new series last week. If you uh, didn't get a chance, watch it. It was awesome. Um, and, and he was speaking from Matthew 16, chapter, uh, verses 13 to 20. We didn't talk about this. We didn't even plan this. I'm picking up on the very next verse. <laughs> Um, so it, like, it works with my other series, it kind of works with Jason, so I was like, this is meant to be, it's meant to be. Um, so we're going to pick up, um, oh, and, and this means, so Jason, he laid the foundation. Um, you know what's happening in Caesarea Philippi, um, Jesus just changed Peter's name from, um, from Simon to Peter, which means rock, and Jesus says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So God, he's revealing to the disciples who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah. He's revealing all that to them, and they're getting excited. What does this mean for us? What does this mean for Jerusalem? What does this mean for our people? Like, this is going to change everything. And so, picking up in verse 21, is there a little feedback? Am I, can I move? I don't know. I'm, I'm here to ring, but... Okay, I'll go this way, go this way. Okay, no, all right. I don't, what can I do? I don't know. So, picking up verse 21... From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And the Passion Translation says he reprimanded Jesus over and over, saying to him, God forbid, Master, spare yourself. You must never let this happen to you. And then we get what is probably the most raw, real, candid conversation of Jesus ever. Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, or opposition, or adversary. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And he goes on in verse 24, he says, and Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So why I think you might be spiritually tired, why I think you might be emotionally tired, mentally tired, tired. I want to explain it to you, and I think this verse will help us um, in doing that. Man, I'm, that ring, I, I hear it, but bear with me, guys. Bear with me. Um, have you ever been in a conversation with someone, and, and you thought that they were tracking along with you, like, okay, yep, yeah, we're, we're driving, but then they say something like, well, that's not what I meant, or that, that's not what I was saying. 
or you and the other person are defending, you know, a viewpoint, and um, come to find out, like, they weren't even disagreeing with you or even looking to argue with you, and it's like, oh, all right, my bad, sorry. Well, I think sometimes we see that throughout scriptures, um, whether it's in the story with one of the characters um, or it's us not fully understanding what's going on. And that brings us to Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. Jesus says, I am coming again, and I'm going to repay, or I'm going to reward every single person for what they've done. Now, first of all, reading that verse, you're like, what? That's not what I think is, it says. Um, and if you're familiar with, with, you know, the story of Jesus, um, there's this concept that people merely think is a principle, but um, it's not. It's actually a definition of the character of God, and it's this principle called grace. Okay, grace is a person. It's not a principle. It's Jesus. It's, it's the, grace is the unearned, unmerited, undeserved gift of God, um, which is forgiveness, relationship, acceptance, um, not through our efforts, not through our deeds, but through Jesus. So that's grace. And yet, at the same time, Jesus, who is the definition of grace, here is, rec is recorded saying, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to give each person, I'm going to give everyone a repayment based on what they've done. And, and you read that, you're like, okay, that's exciting, or it's not, right? Like, so, so everything's going to culminate with me standing before God and him going, hey, so 95, that was a rough year, huh? Hey, those high school years, yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, that's what comes to mind when I read this. And I'm like, I don't know if I want God revisiting my past, you know? Now, one of the great tools uh, for understanding what God is saying is a, is a thing called context. Context helps us understand uh, the meaning of what's being said. So let's go back and, and try and understand a little context of what um, Jesus might be saying. Because when I read verse 27, what I hear is, it's all about trying hard. Life is all about doing better, working really hard, because Jesus, he's going to come back, he's going to split the sky, he's going to return, and he's going to say, Casey, I have a list of everything you've ever done. And I'm telling you right now, the list of the bad, dumb stuff I've done is longer than the list of the good, um, smart stuff I've done. And so I read that verse, and, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Whoa, what? No, right? And, and it's, I don't, it's certainly not good news to me. And the word gospel literally means news that is good. Um, and so I read Matthew 16, or sorry, Matthew um, 16, verse 27, it's Jesus, and he says, I'm going to come back, and, and what I give you will be based on what you've done. And I'm like, I, that's, that's normal news to me. That's average news. That's below average news. That's not good news. What in the world could Jesus be saying? Well, the whole conversation starts in verse 21, and it says, Jesus began to reveal to the 12. Okay, Peter's there, and he says, I'm going to suffer in Jerusalem at the hands of the leaders, the priests, you know, the religious leaders, and I'm going to be killed, but three days, three days later, I'm going, to be, I'm going to beat death, I'm going to rise from the dead. Now, one of the 12, Peter, he's there. Um, last week, we, we, we heard that he had his big endorsement moment, you know, with Jesus. He said, you know, your name is now Peter, which means rock, and, and, and Peter, I'm going to build my church on you, I'm going to, this movement's going to be built on you. And then literally three sentences later, we have one of the most awkward scenes in all of Scripture. Peter pulls God aside and says, this can't happen. And some translations say, he kept saying it. Jesus, you can't die. We need you to live forever. You cannot die. And clearly, Peter and the guys have missed the part where he said, I'm going to rise again. Um, they're not focusing on that part. And Jesus says something to Peter that I think is so appropriate, and um, it may very well unearth and uncover why we are finding ourselves weary or, or tired. And he says, Peter, you are an adversary right now. He's not saying you're always an adversary. You're not always a stumbling block, but right now you're acting as an adversary to what I'm doing. He's not saying Peter's possessed by Satan. He's just saying you're functioning as an opposition to me. And Peter's like, I'm, a, I'm in opposition to you. I'm just saying don't die, right? That's all I'm saying. Like, the momentum's gathering. People, the crowds are gathering. Like, let's go overthrow Rome. Let's, let's establish your kingdom. Isn't that what we're doing? Like, how am I in opposition to you? And then he says this about Peter. He says, you are only seeing things 
through man's perspective or, or viewpoint. You are only seeing thing, the, the things of men. You are not seeing the things of God. He says, Peter, you don't understand. You, you're not grasping what I'm saying. You're not picking up what I'm putting down. Because your first knee-jerk reaction is to think man first, is to think Peter first. For instance, when I read verse 27 and said, Jesus will return and he will repay you and me according to what we've done, who's the first person you thought of? I'm going to guess it was you. My bet is you thought about you, I thought about me, um, and so, I don't know, I read that and you're like, what? No, that can't be, that can't be what's going to happen. And so, then that begins an exhausting spiritual life where we, we think things are about doing good and, and earning merit and, and, and trying to do better, um, something that the nation of Israel attempted to do for thousands of years and couldn't do, and their laws numbered over 600 um, and yet, for some odd reason, we believe that what Jesus is saying is, I too, my whole life, will boil down to and be a culmination of what I've done and what I've earned, and I'm going to be judged, and we're in trouble. <laughs> um, and what settles in is what we believe to be the fear of God, which is the, the fear that something bad might happen if I don't do good and if I don't earn enough. And so, you know, we, we, we try hard and we wear our Sunday best and we speak our Sunday language, you know, hallelujah, praise God. Uh, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be nice because it's about me getting into heaven, right? What is the things of men and what is the things of God? I'll define it um, as simply as, as I can. Jesus says to Peter, the reason you didn't just hear me say, I'm going to die and rise again on the third day, the reason all you heard is I'm going to die is because all you're thinking about is yourself first. All you're thinking about is yourself first. And Peter, like the 12, they're pretty pumped. Popularity's growing, the crowds are growing, like we're going to overthrow Rome, we're going to establish Jesus' kingdom. Peter's like, I'm going to be the vice president. <laughs> and Peter goes, this shouldn't be. This shouldn't be. B, I want you to think about that. G, uh, Peter is opposing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You know why? Because he thought about himself first and not God first. He says, you have set your mind on the things of men. That is, you, you think about yourself first. You think about people first. You think about your culture first, how our culture defines success, how you know, we live to, for renown and for honor, like we think about ourselves first. Jesus says, you would understand me. You would pick up what I'm saying if you thought God first, creator first. Because Jesus says, I will return with my angels, and I will reward each person according to what they've done. Now, if, that, and if, 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 that, if your first knee-jerk reaction is to think God first, it will set you up to understand what Jesus is saying so that we don't pull God aside and say, don't go to the cross and rise again in three days, because if Peter can do it, so can I. In fact, Peter, he makes a lot of sense, if you're honest. If we were one of the guys with Peter, and you know, we saw one of the most popular guys of, of the age, who we adore, who we love, who we follow, the masses are coming, people are coming, and he says, hey guys, it's been a short run, but uh, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die. And Peter's like, quit talking like that. Stop it. You're successful. You're smart. This is good. Death is not success. Like, we're successful. You've made us important. This is great. We love this. You're not going anywhere. And Peter tried to stop the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Like, just think about that. Three sentences after his big endorsement. I just think that's so funny. And Jesus says, it's because you see the things of men first because you see the things of men first. So then in light of, of that encounter, Jesus, he turns to the 12, not just Peter. Now he's speaking to the 12. And he says, if you want to work with me, if you want to walk with me, you need to let go of control of your life. Let it go. Trust me with it. Trust me with it. And, so, and then he says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul. There's an exchange happening. See what he did there? He just said what things of men are focused on and what the things of God are focused on. The things of men, think about what? Stuff. 
renown, stature, success. We think that first. What are the things of God? It's the way of letting go of your life, just like Jesus. He, he doesn't ask us to do, to do anything he hasn't done first. And he says, I want you to lay your life down for my sake. And he says, and there you will find it. You will find life by doing that. And he says, I'm coming back, you know. And when I return, I'm going to reward everyone according to what they've done. So now we've done a little context exercise and, and practice. What is the context telling us now? It's telling us this whole conversation is centered around the cross. Jesus saying, hey, guys, I'm going to the cross, but don't fear. Three days later, I'll rise again. And Peter goes, no way. And Jesus like, really? What? You're just thinking about your viewpoint. You're just thinking about your, your view. You don't see my viewpoint. You're not picking up what I'm saying. Peter, this whole world tells you, you know, to, to, to get yours while the getting's good, right? Just keep working it and, and getting what you want, and that's what, that's what the world keeps pitching to you. But Peter, that's not my way. My way is to die. I live to die. Now, he's saying, I want you to let go of your life, and I want my cross to be your cross. For what does it matter? So you, you gain everything that, 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 that the, this world, that the things of men preach and teach, and in the process, you lose your soul? Like, that's foolish, it seems, what Jesus is saying. That's not a fair trade. The things of men preach stuff, and the things of God preach soul, as if, things of, as if stuff and soul are peers, but they're not. And I wonder if one of the reasons we find ourselves weary or tired is because we've allowed the trade to happen, consciously or unconsciously. We accept an unfair trade, and we diminish the state of our soul. And we focus on, on my stuff and my things, and frankly, the very normal things that, that our world tells us every day that we need. And Jesus speaks these similar words in, in John's gospel. And I want to read it to you because I think it kind of further explains and unpacks a little bit of what Jesus is saying. And so it's John, John chapter 12. And Jesus says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Translation, now is the time for me to go to the cross. Now is the time for me to go to the cross. Let me make this clear. A single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it drops into the ground and dies, because then it sprouts and produces a great harvest of wheat, all because one grain died. So two things Jesus is saying here. One, he's saying, I'm the ultimate grain. I'm the ultimate seed that will die, and I will bring forgiveness, and, and I will bring all that. But then in the same passage, it says, the person who loves his life and pampers himself will miss true life. He says, if, if, if we will let self die, if we will let go of selfishness and, and self-serving, you know, looking, looking out for us and, and buying into stuff and things and possessions, you know, all the stuff that my social media tells me I need every day, I don't think there's been a day where, where, where you know, through social media, I thought, you know, I am just whole and complete and I am just secure as a person. I don't think there's been a day where that's what Instagram served me. It's usually quite opposite. You know, I'm not doing enough. I need to try harder. I need to do more. And I wonder if maybe that's why we're a little weary and tired. He goes on, he says, but the one who detaches his life from this world and abandons himself to me will find true life and enjoy it forever. If you want to be my disciple, follow me and you will go where I'm going. We're going where Jesus is going. We're following him. We're going down the mountain. We're going into the valley. That's where we're going. Now, because we think things of men first and not things of God, when, when, when things die, we think loss. We think defeat. We don't think success. We don't see multipl multiplication. But the ways of Jesus are different. And he says, let it die. I wonder if you're weary trying to resuscitate something Jesus wants you to let go of. Something he wants you to let go of. The things of God teaches Jesus first, God first. And that's an awesome place to live because there he says his yoke is easy, his burden is light, it's not on you. And now Matthew 16, 27 
When Jesus says, I will, I will return again, and I will, I will reward every person according to what they've done, this is another passage where it's meant to bring us to the end of ourselves, a very classic approach of Jesus. We're supposed to read that and go, oh, no. Like, what? That's not good. What? No. Right? Why? 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 But then we have to remember the context. This whole passage is about the cross. And it's about Jesus going to the cross and what it will do for you and for me. And it will do what we cannot do for ourselves. That's why the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We can't do this for ourselves. So Jesus came fully God, fully man. He, he, he lived some 33 years, sinless, perfect life. He had all the same temptations we have, all of them. Lived perfect life, didn't, didn't, didn't compromise, never sinned. That's why he could be sin for you and for me. And now at the end of the ages, when Jesus splits the sky and returns to judge humanity, we can now stand knowing that I am hidden in Christ. The 90s are covered. My high school days are covered. The 2000s are covered. I am forgiven. And now I will be rewarded according to what I have done, which the Bible says I am now hidden in Christ. So what Jesus has done is what I have done. Now, I just feel the need to say this does not mean and this does not teach, and I am not teaching that Christians can do whatever they want, live promiscuously, live wild, live selfishly, and at the same time declare, I'm hidden in Christ, right? Jesus says, but the one who detaches his life from this world and abandons himself to me. Jesus says, no, 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 let all that go. Let all that go. That's what, that's what gets us tired. That's what gets us frustrated. That's what I talked about two weeks ago, knowing, knowing the ways of the cross, knowing the ways of Jesus, and yet still orienting our schedules around ourselves. We will be frustrated. We will find ourselves tired because the wear that that has on our spirit is exhausting. It's exhausting. That's one of Jesus' great invitations. He says, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you burned out? Is religious leaving you hollow and, 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 and empty? What's religion? It's trying on your own trying on your own deeds, trying to earn it, trying to be good enough. By simply believing in Jesus, all judgment is, is exhausted in his body. That's what the cross did. And now verses like Matthew 16, 27, when we think Jesus first, it only beautifies and exemplifies the dimensions of his love and his goodness and, and his grace and, and all that he'll do for us. That's the good news. This is the good news. Matthew 16, 27 is not about our doing. It points to his doing. It points to the cross. And then there we can trust. We can rely on him. And uh, I, I want to end with, with one more scripture. It's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is Paul now speaking um, to the Corinthians. And he says, don't fool yourself. Don't think you can be wise merely by being up to date with the times. He says, be God's fool. That's the path to true wisdom. Um, you know what God's fool is? 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul, he, he, he spells it out. Paul was, he, he had memorized the entire Old Testament. He was like a genius. So, so take that, he was like a genius, but he said, for I've determined to know nothing among, amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I'm keeping it simple. 1 Corinthians 2, 2, that's God's fool. It's, it's, it's not about me, it's about Jesus. That's God's fool. He says, that's the path to true wisdom. What the world calls smart, God calls stupid. Is that clear enough? <laughs> the priorities of this world, God generally calls stupid. The curation of stuff and, and things and status and, and renown and, and reputation, all of which isn't inherently wrong, but it's the, it's the desire and the craving for it that, that our world tells us that, you know, that's what we'll be remember, remembered for. That's what is success. That's wisdom. God says it's, it's a stupid way to live. And then it says, he exposes the chicanery of the sheik. The master sees through the smokescreen of the know-it-alls. I love that. And then Paul goes on, he says, I don't want to hear any of you bragging about yourselves or anyone else. Everything is yours as a gift. Now, the Corinthians, they, they started to develop an ego and a pride around so-and-so is my pastor. Now, I've accomplished this. You know, we're better than you guys because we've done this. Our church is bigger because we... 
Paul says, I don't want to hear any of you bragging about yourselves. You have all of this because of Jesus. In fact, he lists Paul and Apollos and Peter, the world, life, death, the present, and the future. He says, so, so don't brag about Paul or Paulus or Peter. Don't brag about the world. Don't brag about life. Don't brag about death. Don't brag about the present or the future. He's saying that the, the, there's a whole new way to live. That's, that's not about your ego. It's not the things of men. It's not thinking of ourselves first, not focusing on our deeds, because that's where you grow tired. That's where we get um, um, frustrated, and, and we have to be enough. We have to do it. We have to earn it. That's where that is. He says, no, no, no. All of it is yours, and you are privileged to be in union with Christ, who is in union with God. Paul says, you don't get it. Your whole life's a gift. Your whole life's a gift. What's more important than knowing him? What's more important than being in relationship with him? That's why Paul says to the Corinthians, who are bragging, they're bragging, talking about their careers, talking about success, who they know. They brag about the future. They brag about the present. They brag about the past. Is that not our world right now? We're better than you because we're, you know, we're morally superior, right? You know, we, we set the standards. We're, we're good and you're bad. It's all oriented around the things of men, not the things of God. And we get sucked into, sucked into it just like the Corinthians did. And Paul says, don't fool yourself. Don't think you can be wise merely by being up to date with the times. Be God's fool. That's the path to true wisdom. What the world calls smart, God calls stupid. It's written in scripture. He exposes the chicanery of the sheik. The master sees through the smokescreen of the know-it-alls. I don't want to hear any of you bragging about yourselves or anyone else. Everything is already yours as a gift. Paul, Apollos, Peter, the world, life, death, the present, the future, all of it is yours, and you are privileged to be in union with Christ who is in union with God. Listen to what Paul says. You are privileged to be in union with God. Aren't we fickle? Aren't we funny? How blessed are we? How blessed are we? Jesus says to Peter, your mind is all focused on the things of men and not the things of God. I love that. It's not hard to, to think God first. You know, things like staying in the story, staying in scripture, you know, singing songs which we're about to do, talking with other believers, um, thinking with other believers, filtering the world and, and how things are going with, with each other. and that, th Those are the things that help us think God first. This very, very well may be why we find ourselves weary and tired. But, but our king is great. He's done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. That's, that's what this passage is about. It's about the cross. In him, we have rest. In him, we have release of stress. In him, the, the end of the rat race is there. In him, it's the end of striving, it's the end of comparison, it's the end of competition. It's the end of keeping up with the Joneses in Jesus, right? And yeah, I just think we, we find ourselves frustrated, we find ourselves tired and weary when we try and do both. We, we, we try and do the things of God, and yet we try and, and, and listen to the wisdom of man and the world, and it pulls us in both directions, and... It's it, it, the only thing, we can only be frustrated and tired. That's all we can be because our spirit is at odds. It's like in a tug of war match. You're not going to find harmony there. We're not going to find peace there. We're not going to find, you know, the mission is people and we can't do that when ourselves are in tur 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 turmoil. Ooh, it's a hard word. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I was excited when Jason gave me another chance to, to talk and I was like, ooh, I want to keep talking about this because I think this is what we need right now. We need, um, we just need to stop listening to the wisdom of, of, of man and just focus on, on God, on Jesus and what um, he says. So I'm going to invite the, the band up. You guys can join me up here. And uh, I just, yeah, we haven't been able to do church for, for a while. I know we've been back at it for a few weeks and um, I just love being able to do worship again being able to sing again a, a, as a community. And so um, I just want to encourage you guys um, to let, let's sing. 
this morning. Let's really sing this morning and, and worship God um, and just bring heaven into this room. Um, you know, we, last, last time I talked, talked about those mountaintop meetings. Let's, let's meet him on the mountain right now so that later this week, you know, into the month, we can go down the valley full of God, full of faith um, to, to, to be on mission, to love people and to be a representation of him. So, Father, we thank you so much for, um, for just who you are, for these raw moments in Scripture where we see your heart and your passion um, for us to, to, to just live with you in mind and not the world in mind, to think God first, not man first. But I know I, I need more of that, and I need help with that, and I, I think we all do. Um, so I thank you for this reminder in, in, in Scripture and you and this encounter with Peter. I just pray that you would uh, power, empower us as we go into our week and go into the rest of this month, Lord, to, to just be a light, to be a light in our workspace, to be a light in our community, to be a light in our family, Lord. Lord, thank you so much, and Lord, we, we, may your presence just be with us this morning. We love you, Lord, so much. In your name we pray. Amen.